So today the media diary was uh, due. I hope everybody did okay. Ooh, 13, 13 submissions so far. So we're going to want to have these in as soon as possible because after today it's going to start costing you points. Um, <clears throat> you know, for late. So. So is it is it late if it was submitted after eleven o'clock? No. No, we just want it today. And if it can't be done today, then as soon as possible. It's like 10% a week or something. So just, uh, all right, cool. Um, however, uh, any questions about it? Because I just assume that unless all 13 of you are here, <laughs> then maybe there's some reason that's being held up. Yeah. Yeah, so I was having a problem with like logging into Canvas. I like tried to log in and I changed my passcode and everything that still like locked me out I wasn't able to log in at all oh, okay get onto it and so I brought in a hard copy great so I have one fantastic yeah. and so then the other thing about getting access to canvas is you should get you know call the help desk and find yeah. out why yeah I'm gonna go through figure that out today. you know where it's I mean it, it is on the website of City College and maybe any anybody else who might have had this problem yeah same, same thing Parker yeah okay Awesome, good, you guys are covering yourselves. That's excellent. So, uh, okay, would anyone like to, you know, just share, talk about what they found out or anything like that? You don't have to read it out, or read out your conclusion or just talk about what your takeaway was. Yeah, Dylan? I mean, uh, like like I was saying before, like I found like on like a leisure day when I'm using my phone and like just all my media devices that I was on my phone primarily like a lot of the time. And then during a, like a work day or a school day, I found myself to be on it like significantly less, like maybe like four or six hours out of the day versus like 15 to like 20. Wow, yeah. wow, wow, wow. Oh gosh, all those hours. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So, and then on the day off, I said I chose like not use my phone at all and like just go out and like explore the city because I'm new and I haven't like really explored it. And that was, that was fun because I was just kind of detached from everything and just kind of roaming around. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So, so did you feel like you were missing anything without the phone? Not, or Not no? really. I felt able. like I was just kind of experiencing, you know, life without a device. <laughs> Make it a kind of exploratory day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It was fun. How did everybody else experience that? Sarah? For me, the contrary, actually. Because I realized during the week, I'm so busy between school and work that I don't really have that much time to spend. I mean, I spend in the extreme of the day uh, time and maybe, you know, if I'm searching Google Maps or this thing. But during the weekend, because I'm Sunday in particular, I spend more time in the... On, on, the, on phone. the phone, on the device. Because I take yeah. more time, like for reading news, for example, uh, uh, for listening exactly. to music, and I use phone still, you know. Okay. But I gave up the PC, not the. Not oh, okay. The, I mean, I can. I, I, and, I, and how was that? It would be cheating, because if I move, I use it, and I don't know. Like in the weekend, I call my parents, for example, so I spend time, like significant time, especially yeah. in the morning, to yeah. call my, my family. Uh, so I was like, you know, I can't. Yeah, yeah, and in a way that's, that's fine anyway, because that's a point-to-point -point type of communication, so it doesn't fall into what we're mm -hmm. necessarily looking at. Yeah, but is, still, you know, I take more. more time probably for using for different reasons than, you know, just like five minutes for... But yeah. I'm not that dependent to... I mean, I try to... Mostly, like since I came here, I'm not that dependent. For example, I never watch TV. I mm -hmm. think I've, uh, unless I was at somewhere else, uh, house, I don't watch TV oh. at all. Oh. Did, did other like, people like uh, no TV at all or just about? But in Italy, I do. I mean, it's strange this thing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually chose to give up like TV. <laughs> I don't know, like I definitely, I like realized like on the other days like I would find myself like procrastinating or like pushing stuff off to like just to, like watch TV or like my TV's like just on in the background and stuff like while I'm doing other stuff. Uh, so it's like constant like 
distraction almost. Oh yeah, yeah. But like I'll do things like quickly and be like more like frequent breaks, but then I like the day I like chose my day off to do like to not have anything and it was like I got so much stuff that it was so nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. No That's interesting. Did anyone feel like a, a you know a, a loss, a hole, a, an anxiety about not having your favorite media? Parker, yeah. My what friends gave me a lot of crap about, oh, I couldn't get a hold of you for like a good 10 hours. And I was like, yeah, no Okay, <laughs> okay. But, I mean, I wasn't really like. So like, they were upset. You were like, you were in control like, of it. Yeah, like, I, I was you were in control. Like, That's cool. Okay. Simon? Okay. Sam. Oh, sorry, Sam. Yeah, sorry. Um, I have noticed that I make such a big habit of checking my Facebook that I did it without even noticing when I wasn't supposed to. Ah. <laughs> so it's such an ingrained habit. Yep. Any other thoughts on it? I mean, when you when you figured that out, was it like, oh, I shouldn't do that? Uh, or... um, no, I didn't figure it out the whole day. I checked a few times and I was like, oh, I'm going to put it away. OK. But it was reduced, maybe. Yes. Yeah. OK. And Dylan? No, I was going to say, actually, I got a few of my, my buddies from back home who were living in San Francisco. To, do the day off without a phone with oh, me. Oh, wow. I actually enjoyed it as well. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You're, uh, I like told them my assignment. Evangelizing. Like, well, I'll do the day off with no phone. Like, give it up. Give it up. I, last semester we had a class that everyone was really, they, I think we, we came up with the idea they were addicted to their phones a lot. And, and so people giving up the phone, there was much more talk of kind of anxiety about not having you know, their fix, their phone fix or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You guys are in control. That's good. That's <laughs> what it seems to be, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's good if you can make an event of it and it's not like, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just sitting there. But sitting there can be productive. It's true. Are there any other thoughts coming out of it? It's dragging you. All right. Well, I'll be interested in, in reading what you did. So if you, if you didn't get it in, remember the penalty starts after tonight. So you want to get it in to, as soon as you can. Wow. Oh, yeah. And uh, I mean, I guess the other thing is, I just should keep on checking out on the chat, but uh, for folks who are, you know, joining us just streaming, uh, it's a big help to me to know that you're actually keeping on board with the course and at least, you know, turning in an assignment. If I don't see you and you're not pleasing me by signing in in chat, um, you know, then it's a... If, if, an assignment is a big, uh, hey, I'm actually in the class. I'm actually doing something because I got, I got census coming up on Monday. So I do need to know who's doing stuff and who's um, maybe fallen by the wayside. And we'll do that. All right, anyway, thanks for that. I'll be looking at your, uh, at your stuff, trying to find something um, <clears throat> worth saying back to you about your media use. It could be interesting. Uh, the, up we have before us uh, this uh, the radio music box memo from David Sarnoff. 20, about? What is this? November 1916, January 1920? I don't know if that means it was revised. or. Uh, so, so this is a, uh, a young David Sarnoff before he became the president of NBC, which you know was uh, created by um, RCA, Westinghouse, General Electric. They were the... Uh, beginning investors in it. Um, but, you know, it was an open question at the time as to uh, what's going to become of music, you know? Again, they're figuring out that, uh, yes, they knew it would be a point-to-point uh, -point communication system, kind of a wireless telegraph, but uh, they're thinking through, okay, a mass medium? Like, how would we do that? We know we make money on a telegraph because people pay us to transmit a message. But what happens, you know, if we just give it away? How are we going to make money then if we just broadcast something out? Um, you know, so, so this is what Sarnoff actually wrote to his bosses, which apparently they didn't pay much attention to, but eventually he became the boss and, you know, within a few years was, was sitting atop that network. <laughs> so he was able to put his ideas into action at that point. Um, so, you know, I have in mind a plan of development which would make a radio a household utility in the same sense as the piano or the phonograph. The idea is to bring music into the house by wireless. While this has been tried in the past by wires, so believe it or not, there was a kind of pseudo broadcasting system which would uh, put uh, music over your telephone. 
So uh, you could, you know, if, if you just picked up the right line or whatever, you could hear very poor quality music playing back over your phone, which was not a big success. And it was, it was a subscription service, so it didn't work. So that's what he's referring to. But uh, as, you know, as he goes along, he's talking about, you know, how can we produce uh, a, a music system which is going to be interesting. And here there's talk of, you know, transmitters, how far they have to be, and, and so on. So this is early al enough along that uh, the, the thing still didn't sound too good. It wasn't too, um, too high fidelity or stuff. That's it. And then here is, I was digging around in the New York Times just to find uh, one of my favorite old articles, which uh, 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 is written by Sarnoff. And just for some reason, I cannot pull it up this way, and I cannot log into the New York Times myself. Um, but, uh, you know, this is sort of like what history in its first draft looks like. I mean, you just find uh, discussion of discussion of radio in many different ways. This is just... Uh, as the power became uh, uh, better for you know transmitters and receivers, and remember it was uh, it was Armstrong and uh, Armstrong, the inventor of FM radio, and uh, remember DeForest, DeForest, the inventor uh, of what was called the Audion tube, right? So DeForest, this early inventor. The audio on tube was like an amplifier, and what it did was it it, uh, it amplified the radio signal. So you would you would get onto a, a frequency, and the signal would would uh, um, be regenerated within the audio on tube, which could kind of like just multiply its power many times over. And Armstrong uh, created this heterodyne circuit, and uh, that allowed a much uh, more tunable radio system. And also uh, Armstrong got into a fight with DeForest over the audio on tube because part of the heterodyne required technology from the audio tube. So DeForest said, I, you know, I'm the one who invented all of this stuff. Uh, Armstrong, you know, said, well, no, the heterodyne is mine. He made a lot of money off it. DeForest sued him to try to get some of the money back. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of embarrassed himself in a series of court cases where he really couldn't describe why the heterodyne system worked, whereas Armstrong was a, you know, a real engineering genius. Eventually, in fact, uh, DeForest won one of those battles, and Armstrong just went on to develop FM radio. The Audion was a big deal, and it's, that's what's powering this type of uh, uh, high-powered radio uh, transmitter systems and stuff. You notice the uh, station names at that point. These are all experimental names, like WGY and stuff. So, but I know if you, um, if you look at the radio dial now, you'll see, for instance, like KMEL or uh, WKBR, a public station in Boston or something. So. Um, this was uh, part of the Radio Act in uh, 1927. They split the country down the Mississippi River, and the west coast, or the west part of the country, all the radio station licenses came out with a K. And on the east side, everything was with a W. So you'll still see that now. You know? So that's why it's KYLD, or KMEL, or KISQ, or AFOG. I mean, those are. It's it's because of it's because where where we are located in the country. So it splits in the Mississippi. So that was just part of um, you know the the regulatory aspect of all this. Um, yeah, and and uh, a couple other things. We're just revisiting a few of the things we talked last time. But 1927, the Radio Act also. You know, prior to that, you know, we talked that there was an explosion of radio in the 1920s. You know, that this is this is from when exactly? This is probably pretty early on. Uh, 1925. All right. So they're still developing higher-powered broadcast systems and stuff like that. But there's already, you know, local local radio stations. There's the one in San Jose that we talked about, which was one of the first in the country, a technical college 
got its own radio station together, and that was eventually sold, and it became KCBS, which is still on the air now. So that's like pro I mean, arguably the oldest station in the country, is, uh, our CBS uh, station here in San Francisco. So, um, you know, before they got into the act of regulating, everyone was on the same frequency. And uh, that, you know, that, that would make a, a big problem when there were several broadcasters at once in one, in one uh, city. And so the first thing they said is, okay, well, you take turns. You know, everyone's on the one, on the one frequency. Take turns, you get like from 8 to 10 a.m., they get from 10 to noon. And clearly this was not good enough. This was not uh, a, 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 you know, the, the regulator was just not going to work out that way. So they uh, then then in 27 they put in this whole system of licensing stations of giving them their actual frequencies in particular areas so that they didn't uh, impinge on each other's signals which was um, which was a you know a, a, a big thing so that got them all off of all being on the same frequency so that was cool. Um, and we, we worked our way through the history of, uh, of radio up until um, the Second World War. Right? One name that we didn't get to, in the early inventors and stuff, is Tesla. Anybody heard of Tesla? A lot of people heard of Tesla, yeah. He's, uh, he's kind of your, uh, your, um, uh, your, your anti-Marconi or something. He's, he was really brilliant. I'm just looking into where is, we got a video on that. And it's, it's very interesting, the two, the two thinkers that work on this incredible invention. So let's take a look at that quick. This patent, filed by Tesla in September 1897, is the fundamental technology for radio. But it would be 50 years before Tesla got credit for his invention. Various people in various different countries uh, uh, had the idea of exploiting this as a means of, uh, of communication. But I think Tesla was the one with the real vision, in which you would broadcast signals on a, a definite carrier frequency, and then you would have a series of antennas that were sensitive to one frequency only, tuned to a certain frequency, and would detect just one of these signals uh, and make an, an intelligible transmission. Uh, and uh, once again, his vision describes the world that we live in. Yeah. Meanwhile, Marconi was doing more practical things and succeeded in transmitting a signal five miles on the Salisbury Plain in England. Not to be outdone, Tesla decided to introduce an entirely new invention. In a specially constructed pool, potential backers were amazed to see the inventor controlling the motions of a small mechanical boat with no wires attached to it. This was the world's first radio-controlled device. The machine even seemed to think. Someone threw out the question, what is the cube root of 64? And four flashes came back. The audience was so surprised, Tesla had to remove the lid to prove no one was inside. Marconi arrived in New York in 1900 to attract investors for his new company, Marconi America. He filed a U.S. patent for a system of wireless telegraphy, but it was rejected because it was similar to Tesla's invention. It became obvious, I think, to Marconi as well as to other experimenters at the time that the Tesla system was an efficient, powerful resonator that would produce electromagnetic waves that you could work with. Confident on December 8, 1901, Marconi took another step forward and transmitted his famous letter S across the Atlantic. Tesla dismissed the Italian's advances. Marconi is a good fellow. Let him continue. He is using 17 of my patents. <laughs> the simple fact about Marconi is that he used Tesla's system to transmit signals and claimed that these were ideas that he had developed himself. Morgan began to doubt the wisdom of his investment. Marconi's system not only worked, it was also inexpensive. 
In 1904, the U.S. Patent Office suddenly reversed its previous decisions and gave Marconi a patent for radio. Tesla's melancholy turned to anger in 1909 when Marconi was awarded a Nobel Prize. Mr. Marconi is a donkey. <laughs> the question of Tesla and radio is certainly a very interesting one. It's clear that Tesla, in terms of uh, certain basic notions of, of radio, was very early, if not first, uh, in expressing them and even of getting uh, of taking them to the, to the patent stage. In desperate need of money, Tesla brought suit against the Marconi company, claiming that his patent rights had been infringed. But he lacked the resources to wage a legal battle with a large corporation and ultimately gave up. Marconi had received the Nobel Prize for work that Tesla correctly believed to be his own. I suppose everything is fair in wireless as in warfare. <laughs> everything fair in wireless as in warfare. Well, so that's, I mean, it's, again, just a corrective. We said that Marconi, you know, got he got the credit for it largely because he was an efficient promoter, and uh, and uh, you know the other thing is, is uh, as the technology was taken up, Marconi was part. You know, American Marconi didn't work because the First World War came in, and after the war, they decided that they shouldn't have uh, foreign foreign uh, foreigners basically able to own uh, radio companies, radio stations, and stuff. So. That's when RCA came about as, you know, Marconi, uh, the American Marconi Company became RCA in order to um, obey that, uh, you know, that point of view at the time. So, um, yeah, but Marconi gets it, but it seems like Tesla had, had a lot of it in terms of an invention already in his mind if, if he wasn't able to do the legal types of things that DeForest. And I noticed in that, that picture of all the guys standing around, right next to Tesla is DeForest. So it must have been some kind of radio inventors get together or something. But they all had pieces of their patents. Do you remember what set, uh, put, temporarily stopped that kind of competition between them? World War I. World War One. that's right, yeah. So. They, they were able to, uh, uh, the government took over all the patents and pooled the technology to come out with the best possible radio system. Uh, and that was uh, a big step forward, yeah. So uh, I think we got pretty far on in the history uh, beyond that. We were talking, um, yeah, we got through to the Second World War, right? We talked about the Biltmore Agreement, right? Which was, it's an interesting thing, as you see, um, uh, old media trying to contend with the threat from new media and the, the Biltmore Agreement was where the, the news news corporations, the, the wire services and the big radio businesses got together and agreed, well, you know, uh, you can have our news as long as you don't put it on in competition with our, our newspapers. Wait till the end of the day when our evening edition is sold and then you can put news on, which is what starts off, you know, an evening broadcast of news. Uh, that sort of fell apart after a while, but the broadcast industry began to have its own uh, uh, stars like Edward R. Murrow. Uh, Second World War, yeah, speaking of Murrow, uh, he became very famous during the Second World War broadcasting from London during the Blitz. So uh, he was, uh, you know, he would position himself on a rooftop Night after night, he'd sort of do a kind of a play-by-play -play about the air raids, the bombardments and stuff, and sometimes, you know, dramatically, like, yelling into the microphone when you could hear the bombs going off and stuff. So real kind of, you know, um, shock and awe type, uh, type experiential broadcasting. And, uh, you know, it's, it's impossible to, uh, uh, you know, scientifically assess the effects of that, but imagine you've got, um, you know, a uh, charismatic American who's uh, broadcasting night after night about uh, the trouble, that, you know, that our, our kind of traditional allies are having in England. So America was holding off from joining the war for a long time. 
but I imagine those broadcasts would be pretty influential, you know, in terms of making Americans feel like, you know, what's going on in a way that, um, that newspapers couldn't really do at the time, right? I mean, you could read about it, you could see photographs of, of stuff blown up, but here you had somebody who's kind of like, somebody you might even, you know, feel that you know, who's experiencing right, right along with you. And it's happening in real time, right? I mean, it's the, it, it takes however long for the radio signal to cross the Atlantic, but, so, and night after night. So, so you know, there's, a, there's that aspect of simultaneity, that, that human quality of being there with somebody, you know, that print just couldn't emulate. So, uh, it, you know, again, it's a, it's a great thing to look at, you know, the, uh, the, the characteristics of each medium as it comes out and think about how that's going to affect people. Especially looking into a future where VR is going to be that much more uh, accessible to everybody very, very soon. You know, you're talking about a very intense experiential uh, technology. Sam? On the subject of virtual reality becoming a thing, how many of you guys have heard of VR Chat, the game that's basically like an updated version of Second Life? You put on your headset and you talk to people in a virtual space. No yeah. one's heard of it. I've heard of it. Okay, how many? Someone's heard of it up here. Yeah. Good. Well, everyone was expecting like online friends would just get together and talk, and this. that's what the expected thing was. Yeah. But no, instead you got people who are who are a who are like transforming themselves into a poorly made uh, 3D model of Knuckles, asking people if they Knuckles the Hedgehog. Or, yes. Or, or Asking Sonic. If they know the way. <laughs> so there's more play than they there's thought. More, there's more complete. Once, when you have control over what you look like, things don't become more sexual. Things don't become more interesting. Things don't become more social. They just become insane. <laughs> so that's the, fu the future of virtual reality is people messing around. That is okay. Okay. High point military simulation yeah. and the obvious pornography becoming obsolete. I'm done. Okay, thank you. The 30 second. Let's see, Jonah, what do, you, what do you have to add to that? I feel like that kind of happens with like new technology, though. Like, there's always like it's a tool and it's like something that is super groundbreaking, but I mean, I feel like social media is just a bunch of people messing around right, online. Uh huh. So uh -huh. How much different is that? So that's where you're, you're adding into the theme of Sam. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's true that, uh, uh, that the promoters of technology always come with the, you know, the most value-laden utopian ideas about what it's going to do. I mean, I lived through the, you know, the beginnings of chat rooms as text, textual creatures. And you know, I must have mentioned this dude, Howard Rheingold, who lives in Marin, just writing this book called Virtual Communities. And it was all about how we'd be the most virtuous imaginable people. You know that through online chat, we'd support one another, we'd give, you know, communicate information and stuff. This is like in 1990, 1995, maybe? It's not that long ago, you know? And then it, you see how it develops eventually into a whole range of things, both, you know, what some people might say is, you know, really valuable, kind of cognitive, useful learning stuff, emotionally positive stuff and then a whole bunch of other stuff which is you know kind of anarchistic and you know come what may it, it turns into like just a a big ecosystem kind of you know sam hand up Natural meme warfare <laughs> okay we're seeing some of it yes yeah I, i'm a veteran of three meme wars okay <laughs> so so it's uh it, 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 it's worth looking always at back at the early early uses of these media, and it, but now of course things are so much more untethered because the bar to access is is lower, and also the society is more permissive in its way. You know, we still have the FCC uh, policing broadcast TV and radio, but uh, otherwise, you know, there's there's not a lot of oversight and clearly not a lot of penalties for um, getting in there and. and um, and playing around with the system, let's put it that way. And, and people, you know, that also is a value in some people's books, you know. Through, through unfettered creativity, all kinds of things emerge, you know. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you're always submitting your, your uh, technology and your, the development of stuff to either political or religious or moral, you know, control, 
you get you know not as vibrant a a, a culture or a, a, a you know, industry as well. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. You know, if 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 Zuckerberg had had to apply for permission to you know start Facebook, it might have taken off. They would have had to sell it a lot more carefully. I guess. Yeah, that's the this you know. Uh, actually, just because the slide is up there, the, the blue book in the 19, uh, late 20s were, was the first attempt to talk about, you know, um, standards, standards for broadcasting in the public interest. So, um, and, and we talked about that long tradition of any kind of regulation comes out, the industry, you know, pushes back against it. Or even better, the industry tries not to have government regulate at all. But create their own, you know, sort of their self-policed standards, uh, where they can, you know, make sure it doesn't doesn't quash good business. Yeah, and moving into then after, so after the Second World War, we talked about, you know, the uh, the boon that the war was to radio broadcasting because the um, newspaper industry couldn't print enough papers, so radio took a lot of a lot of the. Uh, um, advertisers and made more money off them uh, but you know uh, in the immediate post-war period television came out it had been on hold for uh, a decade almost and uh, uh, there were some stops and starts but by the 1950s early 50s television starts taking over it takes a lot of content away from uh, radio and we'll talk about that next week when we talk more about how TV developed but uh, Basically, you know, the cannibalizing, uh, the, the networks were cannibalizing themselves anyway, because, you know, NBC and CBS, and at that point, ABC also was a, a, a third network. They, they had stars under contract. Uh, famously, Kaylee at CBS taught, you know, a lot of the big stars, Bing Crosby, others like that. He, he taught them how to, you know, tax dodge, turn themselves into corporations. Uh, that then became subcontractors to uh, the, the television network, uh, CBS in his case, so they didn't really have to pay much tax. And that was a huge draw. It brought over a lot of stars who started working with C CBS. Um, but the main thing is a lot of those uh, radio shows just moved over into television. So uh, this, you know, is an another thing you could look at is how a new medium like you know, radio in its day or TV as it comes along is always kind of like stuck for content. Like, what are we going to put in there? Uh, and what you find is they turn to old forms of media and they start reusing it. Um, and then as that goes on, in addition, they start to learn and discover what, what are the new things you can do with this. So uh, in, in the early days of radio, it was, you know, get all the local singers in, get the local vaudeville acts in, get the local community theater in, you know. And, um, and so they, they're like pulling on everything they possibly can. Uh, and they run out of interest, and so they start to band into networks, you know, what they called the... The early term for networks was chain broadcasting, remember? Because one station would chain up with another one, with another one. And they would... So, so um, eventually they realized, well, things like, uh, you know, a boxing match or big sporting events, began. they began to actually produce them for the radio. And so at that point, you know, you could really talk about, okay, radio is a thing of its own, and they're starting to, you know, to do new stuff exclusively for the radio. If you're thinking about any current technology, what do you think about that kind of uh, uh, statement or hypothesis that the content of new media is very often old media? Can you think of any media that you're using right now that has some old stuff? Sam? The entirety of the sequel trilogy for Star Wars. Oh, you mean the, okay, I won't ask which number. They basically just did what they couldn't do with the original trilogy because of the advances in technology and frankly a virtually infinite budget due to being one of the biggest franchises of all time. Disney, owned by Disney, yeah. George yeah. Lucas couldn't do it. Yeah. yeah. George Lucas, <laughs> I'm talking about the uh, sequels here. Did I say prequels? I meant sequels. Yeah. 
So we're talking about the last two that came out? Yeah. Uh, Rogue One was really the only good one produced under Disney, to be honest. Uh, I enjoyed uh, them all. But anyway, we, don't, we, you know, we, we, can't, we can't be doing the, 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 it's not a movie criticism class, yeah, but point well taken. You know, that, that uh, even if we're looking at shorter cycles of production, uh, you know, you want to make a movie now, it's like basically go find something that everybody's already heard about and do it again. You know, that's that's what most of the big movie industry is. It's fueled by Marvel and, and et cetera. If you look way back when, though, there's other examples. But Jonah, did you I have something? I'm going to off that, like, literally every movie that comes out is either, like, a sequel or a remake right. or some part of, like, a franchise. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, just, in, it, just to stand out, you kind of have to have something that's already planted in people's minds, you know? And it seems like, to me, it, it seems like Disney buys, you know, tries to buy just about everything that already exists, you know, I mean, with Star Wars, with Pixar, and so on and so forth. But if you look ahead to, I mean, just looking at VR right now with the kind of limited number of experiences there are, but I mean, Sam mentioned the chat aspect, you know, I know there's a company in San Jose, which for instance, creates like a little virtual movie theater and you can sit in there with your friends you know, with their avatar presences or whatever, and watch a movie together. So, I mean, to me, that seemed like a perfect example of, like, as we're getting going with VR, when we're going to have, no doubt, you know, full-on kind of spatial simulations where you can move around. We're not there yet, but we certainly have these commercial systems where you can sit in a room and watch a, you know, watch a TV show with people who might be in Italy or wherever else and, and, and enjoy that together as, as just one of the many experiences that are now available in VR. Yep, well, let's go to Sarah and then... Because okay. I was thinking that the, the awful thing about this is not... And it's not for focusing on the bad part, but it's that they are trying to convince us that this is a positive thing. <laughs> and it's okay. not. Okay. So it's like all the mechanism. Because they are like, oh, it's good for you. Yeah, of course, yeah. if you are very positive and even naive, it is. But actually, it's not. And you object because it gives people the illusion of social contact through the medium? Yeah, because yeah. people instead like putting more efforts to get in contact and, you know, share things with other people, mm. will think that that is the way, and so they don't even need to do an effort or whatever, and the loneliness will become, like, even more and worse, mm. and the way relationships will be created and kept. Mm. Mm. Well, this seems like a rehearsal of the, the thinking about, about social media and sociality through media in, yeah. more generally. I don't know. Parker, did you want to say something? I'm going to cut Sam off because he's had like three talks already, but we can come back to you. Yeah. And what she's saying is like um, certain social medias will show you what like relationship would be, right? Or like going on Tinder, stuff like that. So it's like it kind of like takes away from like, okay, like I can hop on my phone and or a couple years from now, virtually go and high five somebody versus actually going to high five somebody that kind of loses its its flair, I guess. And then just kind of like it'll make you made me think about like, wow, <laughs> I know a lot of people who are dating somebody that they saw online, which is kind of scary because it's like, I, you know, but like, what's I, I, I'll just throw this open to anyone, but like, what's the difference between meeting someone online or meeting them in a bar? I mean, eventually you're gonna you know, develop a relationship and be co-present, you know. But it's like you got like a list to go by. It's like, I got it. They yeah. like nachos, I like pizza, sorry. You know, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it like, doesn't, it so doesn't like lead to the most. instead of just like, oh, like. That's true. That's very true. It changes, it not changes. Not natural, the, you know, not at all. Yeah, well, you know, there's so many things that are not really natural. Though. I mean, if you, you know, you know what I mean? It's like if you stay in touch with somebody over the phone, you know, like 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, you change cities, but you still call each other. Is that natural? Because if you hadn't, you'd be writing letters or something. If you That's hadn't true. that, it's like, I don't know what, what could be natural. That's so, true. Sam, it's your turn. Yes. On the other hand, some of the best friendships I've formed in real life started, in, started on the internet. Okay. I actually beg to differ in this case. True. So uh, for a, a while back, I, was, I went to a convention in Chicago. You're not going to know the name of the convention because you'll use it as an excuse to make fun of me for the rest of my life. <laughs> okay. Even though you can just look up. Keep it under wraps. Keep it under wraps. Go on, though. Um, and I met up with some people I'd been talking to on the internet for like a year. 
Lo and behold, we've met a few times since. It's all been good. Now, anyone who claims that you cannot have a friendship with someone who you've never met face to face has clearly never had one. Mm -hmm. That's possible, yeah. Doesn't make, me, doesn't make me sad, doesn't make me uh, an introvert. No, it's just I have different ways of communicating. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, and, and we, build, we can build that into like a hybrid, you know? I mean, I'm like a hybrid. Yeah, meeting I, people, I, not, you know? Yeah. We're, we're, I mean, we're all hybrids in the sense that, you know, if we learn something through our computer and the next day we tell it to somebody else. I mean, I know it's not a relationship and we're talking about socialization. But, uh, you know, on the other hand, to Sarah's point, you know, there are a lot of people who are made a little bit miserable by social media as well. It's, uh, yeah, every time I check my Twitch feed, I just... Ron, sorry, Ron had his hand up. Ron, what, what do you want to say on this? Can I form a relationship over online? Uh, doesn't that, might not make you more of a sucker, but uh, I talked for being catfished uh, and like one way or another, like you can't meet face to face. I'm sorry, I'm so out of touch. What does that mean, catfish? Is like, is it's like, um, it's, you think you're talking to somebody and you're not? Yeah, it's, 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 it's like, like you think you're talking to Lindsay when you're talking to a 54-year-old Roger. I got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah. Those those were also really hot stories in 1995 when I was, you know, it was, it's true. And and there was a lot of excitement about the potential of, you know, turning yourself into knuckles and playing with your identity. And then also there were fears about it, like you're talking about, which is like just how, how can I trust, you know, the experience I'm having with this person when they may not be anything like what they are, you know? And then I, I yep, yeah, go on. Not to mention, I'm not sure that like, people, I feel like, uh, many people get snatched that way these days. Snatched? You mean kidnapped? Yeah. Oh dear. You mean led into like some yeah. kind of, I, yeah, possibly. I mean, I hear even about, you know, trying to sell something on Craigslist, and you just get jumped or something, and it's, it's gone. But, I mean, the, I suppose that means that there are new, new, uh, new threats, perhaps, and, and new possibilities associated with, you know, sociality online. Well, you have to be careful, right? And, you have to have a fairly high IQ to socialize with people on the internet. I wouldn't say no. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it would be more or less, but I'm, I'm reminded of the Orson Welles uh, War of the Worlds thing that we looked at last class, you know, where just people were completely, you know, catfished in the day or whatever it was. It was just like, they thought they were getting aliens and it was yeah. just, you know, Orson Welles in a CBS studio in New York, you know, pretending the whole thing and they got totally fooled. So I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a period of adaptation and, and understanding about it. And maybe we're even getting a more healthy relationship to social media. I'm not sure. You know, there's certainly, you know, I think people are far more aware that, you know, the kind of simulated life that is displayed on Facebook is all a curation of, you know, like, there's even like buzzwords now, you know, for the greatest hits of your life that you're posting on Facebook or you're going out and actually creating experiences that are going to look good. And, you know, pretty soon probably people will be selling you experiences that you, you know, we get a package, you get the, uh, you know, the, e the Asia tour package and we will insert you into various places and you can put those up online. I don't know, you know, I'm just thinking that it's, uh, you, I think there's less trust even in that, you know, now. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm not contradicting it. These are all positions in a debate about, about, you know, what you happens mediate. when we mediate, yeah. And what did you want to say? Yeah, I was like thinking, cause like, um, when you get a phone and like, it's not natural, you know. It's like back then, if you're going back in time and show somebody iPhone, they're not gonna know what it is. They they experience their whole life like everything was naturally. So I feel like it's not like it's not a bad thing. It's not. A, it might not be a good thing, but I think it's just a tool. And it's like, it just that's the way you should look at it. Because if you get into too into it, then I feel like it's not a natural like. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's not really like the real thing. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so you're taking a perspective, and and it's it's an interesting perspective. But just look at you know like a 2,000 year history of yeah. technological development. You give a phone to somebody who is you know a yeah. Roman a Roman soldier or something. First of all, they'll think it's magic or yeah. something like that. You know. Yeah. But uh, uh, but on the other hand, it's not all that different in the grand scheme of things to you know like the spear that the guy uses to stick people yeah. with you know it's yeah. it, it's something that was built up refined it's a technology that was developed it allows you to do things it's just these digital technologies now allow you so much yeah yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, it's true. And you know, again, the, uh, the, the, of course, what is natural, I mean, when we think about it, we always bring in a lot of assumptions we have today about, you know, how people might have lived before. But, but it's an interesting, uh, uh, long, long-term view of it all. Well, well, cool. I mean, uh, um, so anyway, um, that we got a long way on that idea of, uh, of um, you know, uh, new media incorporating old. But I just keep your eyes open for that because every time there's some kind of recycling. You know, YouTube comes out. What do people do? They share their clips of you know soap operas that they like until everybody gets sued, and then they get to work and. Oh, now you've got you know legitimate sort of programming genres on YouTube that didn't exist before, you know, and and it'll happen again and again. The first thing that people do is just go with that. Okay. Uh, well, what happened with um, when um, when television came in and took a lot of the uh, audience uh, or the programs away from uh, uh, from radio as well? Radio transformed itself into you know. Music and talk, basically, and uh, um, this was, you know, where people started talking about DJs. I'm just wondering. I don't have a lot of slides on this. That's interesting. Okay, um, we talked about the superiority of FM, and it's just really interesting to see how radio recovered from, you know, uh, a total, total, re total makeover, basically, after television took a lot of the programming, and became, you know, more of what we know of it now is kind of format driven music delivery system and also one of the formats was also talk talk radio and stuff that is now seems to be emerging as you know something that's still useful for radio so we talked about satellite radio you know some of the uh, advantages of that um, some of the maybe reasons as to why it didn't take off and uh, and um, here's our you know current radio technology that nobody or almost nobody knows about which is uh, it, it, uh, by current I mean it's actually 10 to 15 years old and other countries in Europe uh, have uh, you know some of them have turned off their FM and AM radio systems and they're completely digital um, so here in the United States we have this thing called uh, HD radio anybody have that in a car or anybody uh, you see, it's amazing. Uh, so this, this system uses, it's what's called IBOC. It means that you can be on 106.1 and you can point, put out your regular FM signal, but at the same time you can also put out digital signals on the same frequencies. And not just like one digital frequency of your main FM, you can put out like sub, subs, so sub carriers, I guess they're called, or sub, I'm not sure, something. Uh, multiple signals to be sent on the same channel. So whereas you used to just have one signal, you can send like three. And if your, you know, if your format draws a particular audience, you know, KMEL, you've got you know a particular demographic. Um, you can design those extra channels with other stuff that they may want. You know, so that it becomes a coherent package of channels. Now the thing is. The adoption is slow because the car manufacturers didn't put HD receivers in all the cars. And the radio stations didn't want to necessarily spend the money to turn their FM broadcasting signal into one that could also be digital. So it, it requires a lot of money, you know. And in those, in those big changes, sometimes the government will step in and say, okay, like, We'll see in TV in 2009, they said it's going to be HD and that's it. Otherwise, you're you know, going to break a law. So um, they didn't do that for radio, but they did it for TV. And so consequently, this, this digital technology, although it's got great quality and offers more content and you know, it builds on the old system instead of completely like, making it obsolete, um, it, it hasn't worked out. So. Um, you know, I think that's another one that um, we have to be aware of is that even if a technology is better, it may not break through. I mean, look at FM, same thing. You know, it, it just came along too late. People didn't want to use it. Uh, and then, you know, just final slide or uh, final slides here. Well, many of them. Where did all these come from? Um, 
<laughs> Jeez, we'll never get through all this. We talk too much about other stuff. Um, well, streaming services obviously compete for uh, the ra the music listening audience with um, with terrestrial radio. Um, nobody needs to know about Pandora and Spotify, it's, uh, so that's good. We already know what they are. Uh, historically, uh, peer to peer sites that were shut down, like Napster, uh, BitTorrent later on. I mean, there's a continual uh, back and forth between. Uh, uh, you know, industry, government uh, attempts to protect copyright, and uh, you know the audiences attempt to get something good for free, <laughs> which is still going on. Um, copyright protection, right? Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act did a number of things to the copyright laws to try to update them so that they were more applicable to this new kind of digital environment, but. Um, it's, uh, it's still an emerging problem. Uh, you know, one thing that you may not be aware of, but the, um, uh, there's a whole new set of performance rights that uh, have been granted, uh, which apply only to digital streaming or digital broadcasting of music. So back to the beginnings of uh, uh, radio in the 1927 with the Radio Act, uh, there's been an agreement in place with those music publishers that uh, terrestrial radio stations will give 10% of their gross every year to BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC to pay the, uh, the, the, the rights for that, for that music. But only the composers are compensated that way. That means if you write your songs, you're doing great for, you know, for the rest of your life. If you performed them but didn't write them, you were out of luck. Um, the idea was that radio would sell records, and so it was enough, you know, that 10% uh, payout and you as an artist or performer would get money from people buying your records. Well, no one buys records anymore. So the DMCA changed that up and said uh, radio stays the same, but in digital streaming, now we're going to have performers' rights as well. So the people who actually perform on these recordings get compensated too. What that has done is it's made digital radio a lot more expensive to run than um, uh, plain old radio. Uh, so it, it, it's had an impact. It's holding back streaming radio services a lot. You know? So that's, that's something to look at later on when we talk uh, internet and stuff. Um, yeah, we've still got, you know, um, the, lo the localism of uh, terrestrial radio helps it. You know, it's, you tune into something going on in your city and your community instead of, you know, uh, a playlist generated out of God knows where from some server. Uh, and, and the other thing is uh, uh, the mobility of it, and that is uh, an advantage that is fast disappearing. Now you can sit in your car and Bluetooth connect to your phone and just hear whatever service you got. I think, you know, that's going to take another hit against uh, uh, terrestrial radio. So. And uh, the government wants those frequencies to turn them into more digital services. You know, that, that, that spectrum, which is still used by FM and AM, could be used better for something else. I don't think there's anything on that slide that we don't know about already. Uh, in terms of old, uh, old, old media, um, there's a radio station that uh, members of my family are, uh, have shows on, and they just got an, a low-power FM license. So there's some... Uh, there's some movement there. You can, it's, it's, it's easier than ever in some ways to get a license to get on old radio laws. Uh, ra old radio? There we go. Financial outlook. Uh, we'll see about that. All right, so we've got this thing called a Kahoot. Uh, did we play? Yeah, we played one last week, right? Mm -hmm. It was kind of like a little, we could get better at showing it to you. Anyhow, let's, let's try one for this week, see how we do. As I said, this is my way of kind of previewing, uh, previewing exam questions and stuff like that for you. All right, David Sarnoff's Radio Music Box memo described a way to make money from broadcast radio. I think that's true. All right, next. Well, the answer is true. I'm glad nine out of 12 people got it. It, it is true. We just, we just looked at the Radio Music Box where he was envisioning a way that you could make money by providing uh, music to people's homes through the radio. So 
All right, up we go. Radio news was controversial. The press radio war happened, settled by the Biltmore Agreement. Biltmore Agreement. All right, woo, an even split. Well, it's true. So the Biltmore Agreement, remember, was named after the Biltmore Hotel in New York City, where they sat down to negotiate this, you know, the wire services and the radio news uh, representatives from the different networks. And so what they worked out in the Biltmore Agreement was that, you know, the newspaper would publish its morning and afternoon editions, and then the radio could go on with the news afterwards. And that lasted a little while. But it's a good, it's a good demonstration of how old media and new media collude to kind of protect each other uh, and perhaps continue to you know, take money from consumers effectively. Who invented FM radio? Was it Reginald Fessenden? Marconi, who's the father or mother of radio? Hertz or Edwin Howard Armstrong? Whoa, all right, we had the majority got the right answer, Edwin Howard Armstrong. So everyone else was misled. Okay, the second highest. Okay, so Marconi is considered the you know, as we as we saw you know vying with Tesla for the honors of being the inventor of radio. But all of these people were involved. However, Marconi's you know real you know contribution was to publicize it and also to think well yeah, you know how we can use it. Armstrong was the engineer who invented the heterodyne uh, circuit which made AM much more powerful and then single-handedly without help from anybody else and unchallenged by any other inventor in a patent war or whatever it was invented FM radio. Uh, he's the guy who put it all together but remember Sarnoff nixed it uh, um, and in fact even uh, uh, lobbied Congress to um, changed the FM spectrum allocation, which basically ruined Armstrong, because Armstrong had set up a bunch of experimental stations that cost him a fortune in anticipation of entering the FM broadcasting business. Sarnoff wanted to kill that business because he wanted people to keep their money for the television sets that would soon be out, and uh, um, went after, you know, uh, Long legal battle, which, as we remember, resulted in Armstrong committing suicide. Very sad. Uh, who proved that electromagnetic energy traveled through the air? All right, we ready? I'm going to skip now. 30 seconds, we're up. Yes, Heinrich Hertz again. The majority was Hertz, all right? So Morse, Morse uh, you know, was involved in the telegraph, right? Morse code. But Hertz was the fellow who demonstrated you know, you have a spark, a very powerful spark over here, and you, you know, set up the right kind of antenna situation. Like 10 feet away, you'll see a tiny little spark jump from one place to the other through the air. Tesla was big on that too as well. Lee DeForest invented, what did he invent, DeForest? Oop, 30 seconds, time's up. Oh, again, we had the, the, the majority. <laughs> Got the audio on tube. Oh, there it is. Dear, why didn't I erase that? Yeah. Yeah. So, remember DeForest, the inventor, didn't really understand exactly why it worked, but he knew it worked. So, boom, up we go. Congress has the right to regulate broadcasting because why? Yeah, yeah it's a different one, right, Ron? It's like, they're, they're building suspense. All right, six people got it right. Uh, no, wait, one person. <laughs> hey, the airwaves belong to the people. All right, well, now I've discovered what the right answer is. Let me try to sell it, justify it to you. Everything yeah. belongs to the people. Well, it's, you know, because the radio spectrum is limited, you can't use every frequency f efficiently for broadcasting. Only certain frequencies lend themselves. Uh, and so it's a very limited resource, kind of like water or, you know, oil or something like that. And so... Uh, these are viewed then as, you know, the kind of commonwealth of the country uh, and the government's uh, part of, you know, one of, a big part of its role is to uh, hand out the favors, you know, control the commonwealth on behalf of the commoners and, and hand it out. So uh, the airwaves is another scarce resource. They license the use of the airwaves to uh, commercial enterprises. So that's, that's their idea of why they should be allowed to do it. 
What we were today refer to a, a, as a network, what was that called in the 1920s? Good job, 10 people got chain broadcasting. That is correct, it was called chain broadcasting. And question eight, prior to the Radio Act of 1927, what was true? Uh, a or B or whatever, all radio stations broadcast on the same frequency. The legislation as it existed before 1927 was inadequate to regulate commercial radio. C, stations were encouraged to take turns broadcasting on the same frequency. D, all of the above. No, we'll cut this at 30 seconds. Okay, at 30 seconds, woo, well, the answer was D, all of the above. So remember, you know, prior to creating the system of, of uh, frequency allocation, everyone was on the same frequency. That meant they couldn't hear each other, so they were told, okay, broadcast, you know, split the day up. You get two hours, you get two hours, you get two hours. And that was just inadequate uh, to found a business on that. So. The answer was all of those things were true. And question nine to 10, Westinghouse was interested in broadcasting because it would do what? People are stepping up, there you go. And the right answer was to allow them to sell more radio receivers. So the way that they worked it out was uh, um, Westinghouse was the radio set manufacturer. AT&T carried the signals through long distance lines across the country. Um, and uh, um, uh, is, GE was involved in the, uh, uh, the broadcast antenna aspects. All right, boom, last one, last one, 10 of 10. Radio stations profited during World War II because advertisers bought radio ads instead of print. True or false? All right, you guys did well on that. Nine of them, yeah, nine realized it was true. Remember, they ran out of newsprint, it was rations. So radio took over advertising because, you know, they could just keep pumping it out over the airways. Awesome, so eventually we'll be using these to review for exam and such. So these, you know, I'll open them up at that time, you can play them again. But that gave you a first taste of the kinds of questions, you know, that'll be on the exam and we'll use them to review so that you're well prepped for your midterm, your final. Thanks, we're a minute late already, so I don't want to keep you from the rest of life. Do turn in your uh, essay if you haven't done so already. You have till midnight tonight before there's any penalties, and after that, 10%. So.